Hello, and welcome to a special bonus episode of the Divorce and Beyond podcast. I'm Susan Guthrie, your host, and I am excited today, everyone, to have one of our former guests with us, Amy Palacco. If you remember, I love that her nickname is Pitbull Palacco, and so I, I had to throw it right out there in the intro, but Amy is back. For those of you who don't remember, Amy was with me just a couple of months ago. She had an incredibly popular episode called Get Wise to the Tricks and Tips of Toxic People, Avoiding Narcissists and Sociopaths in Your Life. And it, it was very popular for a lot of obvious reasons. It had the clickbait terms in there about toxic people and narcissists. But it one of the things that Amy has a real talent for doing, and I think this comes from her background as both a, an investigative journalist, but as well as being a coach, helping women who are going through high conflict divorces, who are getting through the process of and dealing with perhaps abuse, course of control, or other issues, is that she can give real tips on how to deal with the situation. And that's really the missing piece in so many um episodes and articles and topic when people talk about this. So I asked her to come back because she had a recent article in Ms. Magazine that really impacted me. And I think as we sit here in November, which is Family Court Awareness Month, thank you, Tina Swithin, also a former guest, a couple times from Moms Moving On, not Moms Moving On. One Mom's Battle. Yes. Thank you to former guest Tina Swithin, who was on two times before from One Mom's Battle, who has created the Family Court Awareness Month movement. So Amy wrote the, a recent article. We're going to dive into that today about course of control. First, I just want to say thank you. You immediately said yes when I asked you to come on, and I appreciate that so much, Amy. Thank you, Susan. That's because I love what you do. And I knew you were going to bring up the pit bull thing, but that's okay. The pit bull is back. I'm thrilled to be here. And through my journalism, as you know, I really hope to shine a light on these really important issues for women and men. Yeah. And you do a spectacular job of it. We're going to talk about another article that you recently had come out that I was honored to uh, contribute to. And one of your gifts is that you dive beneath the surface of perhaps the glitz or the clickbait signs and really get to the core of the issues as they are affecting you know, I will say primarily women going through the divorce process with some of the significant challenges that they can face. But you're right in what you just said. Some of these challenges flip right around and are easily applicable to male listeners as well. Anyone can suffer from domestic abuse, from intimate partner violence, and from coercive control, which are at the core of what we're going to talk about today. So let's dive into this. The article in Ms. Magazine, which as always, listeners, anything that I'm referencing here are former episodes, articles that Amy's written, her website, Freedom Warrior, everything will be linked in the show notes. But the article in Ms. Magazine, which still makes me think of Gloria Steinem to this very day, right? I just love yeah. you, Gloria. But Ms. Magazine was called Powered. Women tell family court judges of experience with coercive control using new domestic abuse law. And that's definitely going to get people's attention, first of all, that there's a new domestic abuse law, but also that people are telling their judges, right, that this is bringing women power. So I think specifically you are talking about a law called Jennifer's Law, which is was enacted one year ago in Connecticut. And I wonder if you could just lay the background of Jennifer's Law, what it is, what it does. Sure. Well, first of all, it is named Jennifer's Law, plural, for two Jennifers in the state of Connecticut. I am in Connecticut myself, in Ridgefield, Connecticut. I know it's an area you know well, Susan, used to practice in. But basically, so many people have heard of the Jennifer Dulos case, right? And many people have seen the documentary or follow that, you know, she was, uh, you know, we believe killed by her ex-husband who killed himself in a huge family court battle in New Canaan, Connecticut. It's where she lived, right near where I am, actually. But it's also named for another Jennifer, Jennifer Magnano, who 
you know, had several children, was escaping years ago an abusive situation and went to the West Coast living in a shelter and was required to come back to the state of Connecticut to go to a family court hearing. And what happened was her husband shot her and killed her. And, you know, her children have spoken out and spoken out for Jennifer's law. I mean, now uh, victims have the option of appearing remotely. But this Jennifer's law was passed last year on October 1st. Alex Kasser was someone in our state who pushed for that and ironically had to step down from her role in the state legislature because of her own huge divorce battle that was drama all yeah the time. drama right and and it which is you know illustrative of the fact that these things can take over people's lives so what does Jennifer's law do it basically expands the definition of domestic violence to include coercive control and you know let's talk about what coercive control is right it is a pattern of behavior that encompasses other abuses, and it can be overt, and it can be covert, it can be hidden. It is an invisible abuse in many cases, and it's all based on control. I know you've had Dr. Christine Cochiola on before, and you know she often says that coercive control is the basis of all domestic abuse and domestic violence. So having the courts recognize that this is a real thing is huge. It is huge. And I think for many listeners, it's still a bit mind blowing that it's not recognized. And what I did want to point out, and you do a very good job of this in the Ms. article in pointing out, there are only five states in this country that have actually codified or put into the laws the fact that coercive control is a type of domestic abuse, right? And one of the states is Connecticut with Jennifer's Law. Right. And the others are California, Hawaii, Washington, and Maryland. And these laws vary. They have different nuances. There have been proposals in other states that have not been enacted yet. So I think it is growing in momentum. And basically, you know, I also last year wrote an article for Ms. about The Maid, which was that Netflix series, which also is a great example of emotional abuse where the woman who's helping the victim there, this single mom, you know, escaping an abuse situation says, you are an abuse victim. And it's the first time that she's wrapping her head around this and other people are wrapping their head around the message that emotional abuse is abuse. I mean, coercive control includes psychological abuse financial abuse. That's huge. I'm sure we're going to delve into that. You know, it can be tracking someone, stalking them, you know, taking household resources so they can't even get basic necessities like food or prescriptions. I mean, this is abuse. It, it, it is, and it's pervasive. I, Dr. Christine did a special, you mentioned uh, Dr. Christine Chiola, and she did that special two-part episode, one whole episode on exactly what we're talking about, course of control. And then another element of that, which is post-separation or post-divorce abuse, which often takes the form of litigation abuse, legal abuse, which is also something that's not well recognized. There are a myriad forms of the way that this can all take take a toll on people and it's all power. It's all, you know, based upon one party exerting power and dominance over the other party. And that's why it's so important to recognize it. But, you know, one of the things I thought was interesting in your article is we're now a year past Jennifer's Law being enacted in Connecticut and it's not like a magic wand got waved, is it, about, you know, coercive control being recognized and women being, or men, because it goes both ways, it's a gender neutral statute, being protected necessarily. What do you think about that? Well, that's exactly right, Susan. And I wanted to take a look, the uh, the old pit bull Polacco. I, I haven't lost my investigative nature. And I wanted to see, okay, so we've had this. So what kind of difference is it making? Now, certainly I have a lot of coaching clients. Many of them are across the country, but you know, I still have a 
a fair number here in Connecticut. I run a support group called Strong Savvy Women in Darien, Connecticut. So, and I am aware of Connecticut protective moms. So I talked to a fair number of women in this world and kept hearing that a lot of attorneys did not want to bring it up. And I had attorneys myself in situations I've had say, oh, no, no, we're not going to bring that up, right? And I thought, I can't be alone here. And when I started asking around, that was the case. And then I tried to peel back the layer of that onion. Why was that? And some of them have been honest to say, you know, we're a little concerned about using it. We don't want to you know, annoy the judge with it. We aren't so confident in how it can be uh, implemented or used in a case. And in fairness, the law is great, but it does not specify what happens if it is a coercive control situation. It can be considered as a factor in family court in divorce proceedings or post-divorce proceedings, which as, as you alluded to, Susan, there are many in the post-judgment phase. But, you know, we found that there were only a few attorneys who were really ready to, you know, go guns blazing with this law. And that's why I thought it was so fascinating and empowering that these women are saying, well, if you are not going to mention it, I sure am. Yeah. And I think that's a critical factor and, and something that is a wonderful takeaway, both from your article. And I hope from this episode for, for women is that, or men, if you are, if you feel you're suffering from coercive control, if this is an element of abuse in your case, you can advocate for yourself. The, the issue, and I will, I'm just going to backtrack a second because as an attorney, I can tell you, I've, you know, read through the law. I, I've not litigated in Connecticut since the law came out. I moved, you know, six, seven years ago out of the state and so haven't been litigating there. But I can see for an attorney or for the court system where some of the issue might lie in that, remember that courts are based on proof. Like a court system is all based on make, you can make as many allegations as you want but you've got to back them up when you get into court and proving coercive control because it is not the bruise, the broken arm, the things that we see with physical abuse does and always has been part of the issue with uh, emotional abuse being brought into the court system. But that's not to say that it can't be done. And I think the one thing that I take from course of control, and this is for the attorneys, colleagues out there, as well as anyone who's going to go into court is it, it's a pattern of abuse. And I think the pattern is where we can start to really make progress, right? You can show that there's been a pattern of a certain type of behavior. As you, an example, you mentioned financial abuse, somebody consistently taking control of the finances, withholding financial means to, to get even the basics of food, shelter, and medical care, things like that. So sometimes it's a matter of not just one instance, it's a matter of putting all your ducks in a row to show it, right? That's exactly right. And I think it's incumbent on all women or men in this situation to keep records. I mean, I, look, I'm going to be honest, I know it's a part-time job to do that. And one of the women who I spoke to, and I am so grateful to the two who spoke to me, and I completely understand their inability to use their full names, right, for fear of retribution. But one of them, I had a photo of her boxes, right? Yes. Of just, you know, how much time it takes. And, and one of the quotes I use from her is, you know, people say to her, well, you should be working. But what they don't understand is, and I've, I've been through it, and you know, I want to say that I'm not just a journalist and a divorce coach, but I have lived this. I have been through family court battles and it opened my eyes. And I thought, this is America, <laughs> you know, and I thought, you know, I can use my journalistic skills to, to shine a light on this. But so yes, it, it takes a lot of paperwork and, and, you know, documentation, but I also want to get back to what you mentioned about litigation abuse there. Yes. It's right there in the court records. 
you know, when some of these abusers just keep going and keep going, what is their objective? I'll tell you what their objective is. It is to wear you down, wear you down emotionally, wear you down financially, and they will keep going and keep going and keep going until you wave that, that white flag. And that I think is easier for a judge to see, right? That this is vexatious litigation and this person, I mean, there's no way. And I think, you know, you and I are in this world, Susan, but people who are not in this world do not realize there is no way you could have a job and be part of a lot of these cases because it, it is it, it is an eclipse of your life to not just be at the co court hearings, but to prepare. And when someone is a coercive controller and weaponizing the court system against you, they keep you running and jumping and running and jumping. You are spending every waking moment documenting, getting more documentation, doing this, doing this, preparing this, preparing that, not to mention the huge, you know, legal costs. Right. I mean, you, you're a hundred percent correct. It makes me think of the days where I was walking into the courthouse most days and first off, there were always those cases where we all just knew if it was on the docket, it was, and it always was, it was going to be the time suck of the day. Like you better get your case heard before that one was before the judge, or you might not get heard that day. And when the clerk would bring, you know, usually clerk, clerks at the beginning of the court day, bring in a box of the files or maybe two boxes of the files, but certain days they'd have those boxes with all the other cases. And then there'd be like a trail of clerks coming into the courtroom with box after box after box that all had the same name or names as the case citation on the side of the box. And that is a, pro a part of the problem in our legal system. So if we're talking about domestic court awareness or family court awareness this month, um, vexatious litigation is definitely an issue where we see that probably more than in any other area of the law as a weapon that is used by abusers because and this is you know one of my uh, early partners said to me early on paper will not refuse ink susan because i remember somebody filed a pleading and i went charging into his office going this is bs can you believe they filed this motion? Everything they say in here isn't true. And anybody out there who's dealing with vexatious litigation knows that feeling. But here I was as a young attorney going, this, they can't do this. And my the partner looked at me and said, paper won't refuse ink. Now they have to go into court and prove it, but you have to also go into court and disprove it. And that's exactly what you were just talking about, right? The It sucks the life out of you having to go and be prepared just in case to, to refute every allegation, truthful or not, misleading or not, misstating the facts or not. You have to be prepared. And that's what really causes so much harm, not only to the people who are involved, but to the court system as a whole, it erodes the trust in our system. I do think judges need to be more aware and come down harder on vexatious litigation. I, I think part of the problem, you know, we know here in Connecticut, for example, that a lot of family court judges have not practiced family court law. They were taken from something else, so they're not that familiar. And, you know, in the Ms. article, I talk about Betsy Keller and Connecticut Protective Moms and how, you know, her goal has been like, okay, if it's not being implemented the way we dreamed it would, it, you know, in, in the court system, and by the way, the Connecticut Bar Association and the Family Court Media Office would not grant me an interview for, for the article so we could find out about their trainings and what they're doing. But anyway, her strategy has been to educate her moms and Connecticut protective moms who could then educate the attorneys and the attorneys hopefully can educate the judges. And in some cases, as I outlined, of course, the women themselves are just bringing it up when other people are unwilling to, to, but I think, you know, this is something, you know, that is an evolving process. Right. Even one year in, but there are some, you know, spots of light. You, you tell one anecdote of someone in a courtroom that said there had been financial abuse, this kind of abuse and coercive control. And the attorney on the other side said, that's not even abuse. And the judge, ah, 
<laughs> the judge said, yes, it is under Jennifer's law. So we are starting to see some educated jurists and, and you also interview an attorney who is well-versed in, she did not want to use her name. I'm assuming it was a she. She did not want to use her name either. But there are, there is some movement in a positive direction where the law is actually making a difference, I think. Exactly. And I think obviously every state needs to have these laws, right? And, you know, back to what you were saying about the vexatious litigation, Susan, you know, so many people think, oh, this doesn't affect me. You know, I, I've never been in a situation like this. You know, maybe maybe they've been lucky enough to not have a close friend or family member who's gone through a domestic abuse situation. But guess what? I've got news for you. This does affect you. We are all paying taxes wherever you live for these services, the court, you know, bureaucracy, the social services. And, and that's the heartbreaking part of this. You know, we talked about how this can be an eclipse. And I've seen, like when I see this in women's eyes who are my clients or reach out to me for help, they've got bags under their eyes. They, you know, are exhausted from this. Their their kids are pulled into it as well when coercive control is involved because a lot of times the kids are used as pawns. And I know Christine Cocteau is an expert in that and helping parents deal with that dynamic. But, you know, we are paying for the social services in many ways. And then some of these kids will struggle in school as a result of this. So, you know, this affects all of us. We cannot turn a blind eye. And I will tell you, so many people think it doesn't affect them now. And then a year from now, something happens in their marriage or their sister or someone close to them. Yeah. I, you know, I want to say first, uh, Dr. Colchiola, Christine, she has a wonderful episode on the divorce survival guide with my friend, Kate Anthony, specifically on helping your children in that particular course of control situation. So please everyone go listen to that on Kate's podcast, the divorce survival guide. And, you know, I wanted to point out another thing. I was talking about those cases. You think it doesn't affect you folks. You've got just a run of the mill divorce, right? You guys aren't high conflict. This has nothing to do with you. Do you remember the story, the anecdote I just told about going to court and hoping your case got called before that case got called? Well, you know what? Those cases, there's probably, I think they estimate these high conflict, high litigation vexatious litigation cases are between five to 10% of family law cases pending in court. They suck up 80% of the court's time, 80% of the court's time. So your case is getting squished into the, the other 20% with the vast majority of other cases. That means your case isn't moving as quickly as it could. It's not getting the attention or even just the rubber stamp that you might need to get your divorce finalized. I mean, it, it is systemic. And all the ways that you just talked about. And so, you know, I'd like to leave this with both for women, say in Connecticut or men who are dealing with course of control, what they can do knowing they have the law, but then also what the people in the 45 other states can do who don't have even the benefit of having a law that recognizes course of control. Okay, well, for the first part, I would say, Educate yourself about Jennifer's Law if you are in Connecticut or one of the states, five states that has a similar law on the books. And this is the key piece of advice. You have to find an attorney who is willing to use it. Who you know, It may take you a while, but you've got to find that person. That makes all the difference. And, you know, I have some clients who, you know, were told in the beginning by the attorney they were going to use it, and then they kind of have backpedaled a bit, and they're frustrated, and they want it used. You know, they may end up bringing it up themselves. But I think it's really important that you have someone who understands and validates what you have been through, right? Yes. And you can always have experts testify as well. I know that's very costly. But in the other states, you know, I think it's incumbent upon all of us to rally and push for this. You know, I think there is a growing movement across the country. I think it's evidenced through the Family Court Awareness Month, what we're seeing, the media covering this more, this type of abuse in popular culture, right? We've seen, yep. you know... 
things like the maid and, and other, you know, bad vegan is another, you know, very Netflix yeah. story yeah. I wrote an article on from that was, you know, a course of control situation as well, even if she wasn't your favorite victim, you know, certainly the Depp Heard case got into that. We won't, we won't unpack that one today. <laughs> But there is uh, another article or there's another episode on that, folks. But right, uh, unfortunately, right, right. that's a case where I don't think it, they got it right. Or, but anyway, we'll we'll move on from that. <laughs> so, you know, I think I think we all have, have to push for it. And, you know, just because there I'm certainly I always have to say I'm not an attorney. I'm not giving legal advice. Right, Susan. But, you know, even if there is not a law on the books, you can still you know, say you are an abuse victim, you know, the, you can still point out what has happened in court. I think that there has been this, you know, trend to kind of muzzle women and abuse victims. And I understand why, because some of the stats show, like Joan Mayer's study, she's a George Washington University uh, professor, uh, you know, who did a whole study about women who bring up a, abuse and how it affects them negatively in the in their court cases and how they're not believed. But we've got to change that, right? We can't just be silent. And I think I think you have a lot of backing behind you, and I and I think we all have to do our part in whatever way that is to change things. Yeah, and and you know, it's one step at a time. You can check out. One Mom's Battle. I know there are resources on Tina's website regarding this. Custody Piece, who's also mentioned in another article that we're going to talk about in just one second, folks. And Connecticut Moms. What's the other group that you mentioned in the article? Connecticut Protective Moms. They have a yes. closed Facebook group and they have a New York Protective Moms as well now. So check that out if you are a, you know, are someone who qualifies to be a member of the group. That might be another place to get resources and also from Amy. So again, I'm going to need to have her contact information in, in the show notes. But before you leave, Amy, I did also want to bring up another article that just came out last week as we tape this in November. But and, and I'll be, I, as I said at the top of the episode, I was very honored to be able to contribute to this article because I think this is another case where you took something that at a high level looked like a glamour headline, taking a high profile divorce. But in the article, you actually dove beneath to a really important and relevant topic, especially for women. And it's something that I'm very passionate about. I do want to say to listeners, Amy is going to come back. We're going to do an entire episode on this, but give a little summary of your recent article in The Independent about why women are jealous of Giselle's divorce from Tom Brady. Well, I should have had the New York Post newspaper with me to show you guys who are on YouTube, but that really is what prompted me to write it because of course I was following this, but I saw the cover of this New York Post at my local gas station and it made me laugh, but I kind of thought you go girl because she's like tackling Tom Brady and she's holding up her divorce decree and you know she's got this look of satisfaction. <laughs> And like it was a Super Bowl win or something. And, you know, you know, there was part of me that was like, good for you. And the other part was like, how sad that so many women will never have that. Right. And it's not about mm -hmm. winning, you guys. I'm not saying that. But, you know, so what I really tried to do there is take a look at the, you know, the Giselle and Tom divorce and why was she able to get her freedom? Because a lot of reports are that she's the one who initiated it, right? That how was she able to get that so quickly? But there were really a lot of, a lot of different factors and she, you know, had her own career, had obviously endless amount of money almost okay, that a lot of more people, than Tom. Yes. More than Tom. I've gotten a lot of feedback on this one and people like that. Right. And then also, you know, it sounds like all the reports are that they had an ironclad prenup, which I know is, is something you are a fan of. Right. Yeah. I, you know, I think a prenup is extremely helpful. Ironclad ones are the best. I will point out, though, because I've also gotten a great deal of feedback from having been quoted in that article, and you can have a prenup, and what their prenup covers is their separate property, but they had a very, very 
hefty portfolio of shared property that still needed to be divided between the two of them. And prenups, just so everybody understands, cannot cover children and they have two children. So the custody care and support of children cannot be covered in a prenup because that's just you know, they, that is something that's driven by children's best interests and that needs to be determined under the circumstances of the time. So they still, even though they had a prenup, they had some significant issues to get through and still at least apparently got through them at record speed with a certain level of cooperation, but there's so much more to this story. And that's where you went in the article. And I'm just going to tease that here. I want you all to go read the article and then get ready for when Amy comes back, because we are going to dive beneath and talk about the issues that are, that go to the point of why women don't have the negotiating power that Amy was just talking about Giselle having. And that's really where I think the key to this story is. So we're going to talk about that. It's going to be, it's going to be a little bit of a, you know, a, a splash of cold water in some ways, but we're going to try and give people tips on how they can protect themselves and maintain their, their empowerment if they go into marriage, divorce, having children in a family. Right. I think Pitbull Polaco is going to bring some tough love. We're going to do some, it's going to be tough love. We, we care about all of you and that's why we do what we do, right? 100% and we're willing to say some things that maybe are not going to be popular because we want you to at least have the knowledge and to be able to think about these things. So, you know, one, go read the Ms. article, some great points in there. If you are suffering from course of control, intimate partner violence or abuse, there are great takeaways in here on what you can do, especially if you are in Connecticut or one of the states with the law. But even if you aren't, read the article in The Independent and get ready for Amy to come back in early 2023. And Amy, thanks so much for jumping on this and, and getting on this, this episode with me so that we could put it out quickly during Family Court Awareness Month. I really think it's important to do. So thank you. Thank you. And I hope that our tips help everybody out there. I mean, that's why I'm doing what I'm doing and I look forward to coming back. I'm excited about the next one. <laughs> yeah. And before we leave, just make sure for those who don't go to the show notes, how, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Right. My website is freedomwarrior.info. You can also find me on Instagram at Freedom Warrior Tribe. And I'm on LinkedIn as Amy Polacco. It's P-O-L-A-C-K-O. I offer a free coaching consultation. I'd love to talk to you. I have clients across the country and my heart has led me to this work. So I look forward to hearing from you. And she's really good at it, folks. So reach out to Amy. Come back in early 2023 when she's joining me again. Go listen to her former episode and get wise to the tricks and traps of toxic people. Amy, thank you so much. Thank you.